Western philosophy, we have this concept of the rational, self-interested person who makes decisions in a kind of a, a maximizing benefit sort of way. And what the behavioral scientists tell us is that this homo economicus doesn't exist. They challenge the premises upon which a lot of the traditional legal, economic, and philosophical argument is based. And they say we are what Dan Ariely calls predictably irrational. Essentially, we display systematic cognitive biases. Now, I mean systematic in two senses. Systematic in the sense of the shorthand that sometimes the behavioralists use, they discuss system one and system two biases. System one are the biases that arise from our automatic processes, from things that kind of fly under our cognitive radar. So an example of one of those, for example, would be black and white lines painted on a road as you go around the corner. You take your foot off the accelerator because those lines create a visual illusion that makes you think you're going faster than you actually are. And then system two are biases that can arise from our more reflective deliberations. So, for example, we might think about the presentation of numbers or statistics, but actually we go astray because we've actually set our mind to thinking about it. And they're also systematic in the sense that they arise systematically, they regularly occur, and often we can't do anything about them. So the example of the lines painted on the road, even if we know about it, you are unlikely to be able to overcome uh, the feeling that you're going too fast and therefore you'll still slow down, even if you know what they were up to in painting those lines on the road. Other, other things, though, we probably can do something about. So we make decisions based on various rules of thumb, and these decisions are influenced by a range of factors, so informational, environmental, recall of previous experiences, what kind of stereotypes we have in our head about uh, various people or professions or bits of information. So the classic one they tend to talk about in the literature is if you're given uh, a description of a person as a kind of quiet bookish type uh, who wears glasses and, you know, are they more likely to be a librarian or a banker? People will say librarian, but actually you've gone awry on that because statistically speaking there's more bankers than librarians and so just that description could fit either of those. So these are examples of some of the kind of effects that uh, have been demonstrated by various uh, behavioural psychology and behavioural science experiments. So we're influenced by the way messages are communicated and, who communicated and who's doing the communication. So that was the point of the gallstones example. That's an example of the framing effect. Equally, the clinician could have said, there's a 3% chance that you'll die or have some severe outcome. Um, and whether you put something in a positive or a negative framing can actually influence the way people choose. Um, incentives, uh, not just monetary incentives, but things like loss aversion and status quo bias uh, influence us. So the organ donation example is an example of status quo bias. We don't tend to move away from the default. Defaults are sticky, as they say in the literature. And we like uh, losses a lot less than we like the equivalent gains. So we would always, always uh, prefer not to lose five pounds than to gain five pounds of money. Um, and then we're strongly influenced by social norms. This was the point about the posture and alcohol. So public health messages can be framed with social norms messages uh, built into them. Although we have to be careful that we're actually being truthful with the social norms message because if it comes out that you know, you're saying people drink less but they don't actually do less, the social norm won't work because it's actually about the pressure people feel by what their peers do. And there's all other sorts of effects that have been described in the literature and which policymakers um, have been attempting to draw on. So a lot of you probably know that uh, a few years ago now we had the Cabinet Office Behavioural Insights team uh, which produced various reports um, and then last year they spun out of government and they're now in a kind of private-public partnership with government. And one of the kind of recent health-related things they did was a uh, partnership with the a study with the DVLA on registrations for organ donation. So when you went onto the DVLA website to renew your licence, some of you might have done it and encountered it. Um, at the end you were asked if you wanted to uh, register to be an organ donor um, and you were displayed with uh, different messages uh, to see which one of these messages was 
research has shown that altering the foods in a cafeteria or uh, in, a, in, in a food setting does have an effect on consumption. So more vegetables are consumed if they're placed at the front of a queue or if you've got a square uh, or rectangular salad bar, more foods from around the outside are taken than the inside. If you provide tongs rather than a spoon, then uh, less food will be picked up with tongs than the foods that are done with a spoon. So if you're the uh, cafeteria choice architect, you could redesign your cafeteria to encourage the, in inverted commas, healthier food choices. <coughs> and these are all sorts of other food-related interventions <coughs> which have appeared in the literature and which draw on this, uh, the behavioural sciences. So even uh, you know, the kind of ill-fated traffic light labelling system that we now see in some of our supermarkets, uh, things to do with serving sizes, so making uh, plates smaller, um, soda sizes. Uh, so for example, in New York, they actually have a ban on the size of uh, soda cups that sodas can be served in. You can go back as many times as you like if you're a customer, but if you're an outlet, you can't uh, serve in really large, uh, large cup sizes anymore. But of course, by doing that, it does actually affect what the end consumer consumes. So Google uh, decided to implement quite a few of these in their canteen, and so apparently this is what they did. They do put their salad bar near the entrances. Uh, they seem to provide M&Ms around the workplace, but they're now no longer in transparent containers. And they did a trial on this and discovered that a lot fewer <laughs> M&Ms were uh, consumed. Uh, desserts aren't in the line of sight. They have uh, plate sizes, colouring on the uh, on the food. Um, and now uh, at the at the beverages stands, they they put the water at eye level rather than the soda. Now, so it's not that the use of behavioural sciences in law and policy or indeed medicine is anything particularly new, but it has been politically popularised uh, by Taylor and Sunstein, um, a couple of American academics, in their book Nudge. And they say that a nudge is an aspect of choice architecture that alters people's behaviour in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing their economic incentives. And all that the choice architecture means is the contexts in which we make decisions and choices, and that the way this is constructed alters the possibility that we're going to choose in one way rather than the other, which I illustrated at the beginning. And there have been various other attempts to kind of rescue nudge from problems that people have said it has. So just another example is uh, Yashar Saghai, and he focuses on the idea that nudges trigger our shallow cognitive processes, and they must be substantially non-controlling. So they must leave our choice set open, which is something also that Taylor and Sunstein say. We should still be able to choose something else, so you're not banning anything as far as the nudgy is concerned. So various principles, ethical objections have been flagged up in the literature on this. First and foremost, people claim, well, this infringes autonomy and liberty. This isn't good because a lot of these things work by uh, flying under our cognitive radars. We have no chance to engage with them and deliberate about them and therefore uh, you're subverting our autonomy by not allowing us to actually uh, engage in those decisions ourselves. Because of that, they lack transparency um, and perhaps involve deception, so the, so the claim is. And there's also a worry that uh, because we can't engage in a deliberative process about a lot of these, that they don't represent our true interests and they don't represent authentic decisions by us. Another worry is that people think, well, our decision-making capacities will decrease if we're constantly surrounded by these nudges which uh, don't engage our deliberative processes. And this will lead to an infantilization of our decision-making process and ultimately decrease responsibility on our part. There's also a worry 
seen, and that's like high definition, isn't it? So in one way, Taylor and Sunstein's uh, definition just describes the mode of action of nudges. They are just those influences that leave our choice set open, or they do so by an uncontrolling method. But the problem is they're actually stipulative. So they have very they have a very specific meaning, which actually incorporates the moral criteria on which they're supposedly justified. So, if I just, one of the things is, well, it should leave our choice set open. They include that in the definition, and then they say, oh, well, nudges do this, so they're okay. So, you can get into this sort of circular reasoning in that. And if we stipulate with our definition of nudge, then we have a problem when we're trying to evaluate particular types of interventions against other moral or normative criteria. So if, we, if you think about uh, coercion, the way that nudges are defined doesn't particularly help us to think about coercion, because coercion itself um, is, a, is a morally loaded term, um, which usually involves the foreclosure of options or infringes individual liberty in some way, or is substantially controlling in some way, depending on the definition of coercion that uh, commentators are using. So, of course, if nudges are defined as having an open choice set and not infringing liberty, well, there's no case to answer about co coercion, because by definition, they simply can't be coercive. There's no need for us to ask anything of, of uh, nudges. And I don't think that's particularly helpful. So the idea of a nudge seems to have been defined to meet the requirements of a particular underlying political theory. In Taylor and Sunstein's case, the idea of libertarian paternalism. So uh, libertarian because it leaves our choice set open and supposedly paternalistic because it promotes the chooser's own welfare or it promotes things in their own interests. So what you end up with in the literature is simply haggling over whether or not certain interventions meet the definition or whether they meet the elements of the underlying theory and whether, in fact, the definition and the underlying theory are even coherent. But the issue is that you get this one quite wide and potentially controversial sloppy banner, but there's a wide variety of interventions and policies that could fall under this banner. And so the term becomes a bit meaningless because with all the haggling over the political theory or the definition, you're not getting any proper analysis of particular interventions and policies. Just, is it a nudge or isn't it? Well, that's rarely going to be, uh, the yes or no is rarely going to answer the question of whether or not we ought to do one thing rather than another in healthcare. So back to these principles, ethical concerns, and the couple that I will just briefly say a little bit about are the idea of infringing autonomy and liberty and true interests and authenticity. And what I want to say to you is why I'm not particularly bothered about these, and then I'll tell you what I think we should be bothered about and what I think uh, commentators uh, who are writing about this should be a bit more bothered about than they are. So to kind of sum up the objection, Luke Bobbin says, there's something less than fully autonomous about the patterns of decision-making that nudge taps into. When we're subject to the mechanisms that are studied in the science of choice, then we are not fully in control of our actions. These are cases of not letting my actions be guided by principles that I can underwrite, and in so much as these actions are non-autonomous. So the, the, the concern is that they circumvent rational decision-making and are therefore detrimental autonomy. But is this worry about non-autonomous action really that concerning? If we go back to the paradigm case, we all now know that altering the layouts of food uh, in the uh, cafeteria queue will have effect an effect on food consumption. So if those in charge of the canteen change the layout, they're influencing the eating habits of their patrons. However, if they do absolutely nothing, they're still exerting an influence over the eating habits of their patrons.
what the behavior of the scientists tells they show is, is that they are going to influence anyway. So the point is that influence doesn't just appear every time uh, the university or hospital or government think up a new health-related policy. We're already being nudged by multiple forces, often by market forces. And of course, these techniques for influencing our decision-making, the marketeers are at the forefront of knowing what actually works. And there's also something non-autonomous about all manner of decision-making we make in our everyday lives. Lots of factors, for example, influence my weekly grocery shop, what mood I'm in when I go to the shop, am I hungry, the layout, the smells that pervade the bakery section, and so on. All of these cannot be subjected to some sort of rational <coughs> deliberation. As we walk down the street, we cannot rationally deliberate on every influence that comes our way, especially because we're not even aware of them. So if the main concern of commentators is something to do with autonomous decision-making, that really doesn't have that much to do with the involvement of government and policymakers one way or the other, or if it does, we ought to be equally concerned with non-government actors and, the, and what they might do to influence our choices and decisions, especially given the health effects of uh, companies and markets on our uh, health-related decisions. So in terms of the concern about true interests, the concern is that nudges might make it less likely that our choices, decisions, and actions represent our authentic true interests, whatever they might be. And thus, perhaps a non-deliberately constructed environment might make it more likely that we will make choices that reflect our true interests. But as I already said, there's numerous arbit arbitrary forces that act on us one way or another every single day. And to the extent that they're going to combine to nudge us in directions we would have chosen anyway after reflective deliberation, we could say, well, they serve to promote our true interests. But conversely, if they actually conspire to push us in other directions, they could be detrimental to the realization of those interests. So the point is, it's actually an open question whether or not nudges uh, help us to be more autonomous or in line with our true interests. Um, and it could be that deliberately designed choice architecture uh, helps these, and it could be that randomly generated choice architecture helps these. But we cannot say simply because something is a nudge or it's uh, some sort of a cognitive influence that uh, it actually is against those interests. So just to close, I want to come back to an area which I think has been a bit neglected, and the focus has been on uh, all those principles, ethical objections, which is, you know, the philosophers love and the lawyers love, and that's great. Um, but what's happened is we've neglected some practical ethical issues. And this is about whether or not these strategies actually work. So there may be problems translating controlled experiments into the real world application. So most of the things I told you about, they're often from... Uh, not laboratory experiments, but controlled experiments with, uh, you know, normally done in North America with white educated, democratic leaning uh, graduate students. And so there is a question about how they translate out into the real world and into other cultures and contexts. And when they have been brought out into the world, then uh, questions of effectiveness of behavioral interventions have been brought up. And of course, one way to, to do this, and this is what the uh, Behavioral Insights team favor, is to do randomized control trials of policy, which uh, was mentioned by Martin earlier. Um, but the problem with that is, how far is the government actually going to, do, uh, going to go to ensure the fidelity of the results they're getting? And so what you might get is, if the government wants to engage in uh, evidence-based policy at all, is it's kind of a small study which then is rolled out across the whole country as if, uh, as if that's going to work. Well, we don't know because there's going to be a heterogeneity in the demographics across the country and um, as the methodologists know, transferring the results of one study to other areas is not necessarily simple. And then we're back to this idea of unintended consequences, which is, of course, why we do need large-scale policy trials to see what policies actually work. Um, so the example I've put here, one example is calorie labeling and dieters. So in the United States, they introduced uh, some legislation.
information about the labeling for uh, restaurant chains, again in New York. Um, and some of the experimenters thought this was a good real world opportunity to test what happened. And I should say that the studies conflict. But one thing, so there's no equivocal, you know, we haven't got an answer really on what calorie labeling does. But one interesting thing that did arise in a couple of uh, the studies in subgroups is that for dieters, the increase in calories, the intake of calories increased, which is, of course, the opposite to what <laughs> the intended uh, policy of calorie labeling was to do. And it might be that maybe dieters are just more aware of what their daily intake overall is going to be and adjust accordingly, or it might be they think, oh, it's not as much as I thought, so I'll have that, you know, don't know. Another example is uh, the idea of restrained eaters, so buying little packages of raisins or little packages of this, that and the other to snack on, well what they found is in fact people would eat more of them than they might do if they were otherwise having uh, big packets. So intuitively what looked like it might work didn't necessarily work. And of course nudges or these modest behavioural interventions might not be enough on their own to make any significant or appreciable changes. What we might need is harder regulation of industry and depending on the kind of area we're talking about, bans might be more appropriate. Um, but we need to be aware that when something might be a kind of uh, legal or regulatory requirement for industry, so it might in fact be a ban for industry, but it might be a nudge for the end consumer. So the example that I gave earlier of the soda sizes and also the plain packaging legislation that's currently uh, going through Parliament here or the uh, what we now have is that cigarettes can't be displayed in shops anymore. That's a, that's, a, that's a regulation, that's a legal requirement for the shops. But, of course, it's not a ban on any consumer actually buying cigarettes, but it is a nudge in the sense that it takes them out of their line of sight. So uh, the theory would be that it doesn't trigger their, uh, their visual uh, cues in order to, uh, to buy cigarettes. But the big overarching question that I want to leave with um, is the role of the, what's the role of the state in counteracting market forces? So a lot of the uh, objections to these kind of strategies come from so-called right libertarians who are, you know, by definition pro-market. And they seem to think, well, it's okay for the market to do these, but the state is something special. And therefore, they should be held to a different kind